This is how to take niacin for your cholesterol without getting diabetes. Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Masterjohn of ChrisMasterjohnPhD.com, and this is Chris Masterjohn Light, where the name of the game is Details, Shmeetails, just tell me what works. And today we're going to talk about how to take niacin for your cholesterol levels in a way that won't give you diabetes. So in the last episode, I talked about how I don't believe that niacin should be the first approach for anyone in controlling their cholesterol. I think diet and lifestyle should lead the way, but I do think that there are some people, mostly for genetic reasons, where diet and lifestyle is not going to cut it and niacin may make sense. And I believe that some people are going to be using niacin, whatever my opinion is. And so if people are going to be using niacin, I think it's good to discuss how to do so safely. And what I want to talk about today specifically is how to modulate your carbohydrate and fat intake and how to modulate when you're fasting and when you're snacking in a way that in theory should completely prevent niacin from causing diabetes. As I mentioned in the last episode, it looks like for every seven people we save from heart disease, we're going to give three people diabetes when we're looking at the niacin data. So how to prevent diabetes when you're taking high-dose niacin is a very important topic. This is something that Alex Leaf and I discussed on the podcast that we did together that was split up into two parts totaling three and a half hours on niacin. I'll link to that in the description of this episode. And what I'm about to present to you is actually Alex's idea, not mine. Uh, but it's a great idea, so I want to share it on this channel and I'll link to Alex's blog post about this in the description as well. If you're watching the video version of this, you can now see on the screen some data from Alex's blog post about what happens to free fatty acids and to carbohydrate and fat oxidation when you take high-dose niacin. If you're, just look, if you're just listening along on the audio, you won't be able to see the graphs, but I'll try to explain it in a way where it makes sense to everyone. So in the first two hours after you take a dose of niacin, it suppresses your free fatty acids. That means that your circulating fat is very low. Your body is going to use either fat or carbohydrate for its main fuel. So in those first two hours after niacin, if your body is suppressing the release of fat, it's going to preferentially burn carbohydrate. On the right here, what we're seeing is carbohydrate oxidation spiking in the one to two hours after niacin therapy. On the flip side, after the two and a half hour mark, starting around the three hour mark, we have this enormous rebound where the free fatty acids go higher than they would otherwise be. And so in the three to six hour period after we take niacin, we have an enormous release of fat where, shown on the right, carbohydrate oxidation is brought down even lower than, be, than baseline. In other words, here we have the carbohydrate oxidation uh, where we had not taken the niacin yet. It's even lower at the five to six hour mark. So basically, you're really good at using carbohydrates in the two hours after you take niacin, and you're really terrible at using carbohydrates in the three to six hours after you use the niacin. Now, Alex and I didn't come to 100% agreement on the implications of this, but we are both in agreement that it makes a lot of sense to eat a high carbohydrate meal when you take the niacin. So you could take the niacin and eat that high carbohydrate meal basically anywhere in the next two hours. But I would recommend taking the niacin and the high carbohydrate meal at the same time, in part because I think taking niacin with food is protective against some of the negative effects on the liver that I'll talk about in a future episode. So we take the niacin and we take it with a high carbohydrate meal. Then Alex and I were definitely both in agreement that the last thing that you would want to do is from the three to six hour mark when you are burning, when you have this enormous release of fat, the last thing you want to do is put more carbohydrate into the system. So we are in total agreement that you do not want to eat any carbohydrates in the three to six hour window. 
And we are, I believe we're both in agreement that probably the main reason that one out of 43 people who, who take high dose niacin will develop diabetes from it is because people are habitually snacking on carbohydrate. And that carbohydrate, while it's great in the two hours post niacin therapy, is just utterly terrible for you in the three to six hour post uh, the three to six hour mark post niacin. The one place where Alex and I didn't come to total agreement was that Alex thought that it might be a good time to eat fat in the three to six hour post niacin window, and. My feeling is that if you eat fat in that window, you're just going to aggravate the effects of the free fatty acid rebound and just get a double dose fat bomb in that time period that is not going to be good for your blood lipids or your metabolic health. So both of us agree that the ideal thing would be to, to fast during that period. In other words, eat the high carbohydrate meal when you take the niacin and then don't eat anything for the next six hours. Whether it's okay to snack on something fatty in the three to six hour post niacin period, I think is up for debate. But I lean on the edge of you're probably nullifying the entire point of taking niacin in the first place if you're going to snack on something fatty in the three to six hour period. So key takeaways is when you take the niacin, take it with a high carbohydrate, low fat meal. In the three to six hour window after you take the niacin, my preference would be that you fast and that you don't snack on anything. But the absolutely last thing that you should do, the one thing that you should totally, totally, totally not ever do when you're on niacin therapy is snack on carbs in the three to six hour period after you take the niacin pill. Right now, this is based on theory. It would need testing to see if this actually works to prevent the diabetes. My suspicion is that Alex is right and it would. So for now, until there's further research, I believe this is how you take niacin without getting diabetes. This episode is brought to you by Vitamins and Minerals 101. This is my new free 30-day course providing one lesson a day on each nutrient delivered straight to your inbox. It can go to your email or it can go to your Facebook Messenger. If you get the Messenger version, it's taught by Chris Masterbot, my baby bot, it's more interactive, there are more emojis, and there are more jokes. But both email and Facebook Messenger are incredibly educational. Each lesson covers why the nutrient is important to your health, how to know if you have too little or too much or the wrong balance with other nutrients, how to get it from food, and when you should think about supplementing. It is not a technical or advanced course. It is completely minimum in its technical jargon. And it is designed for the beginner with no background in nutrition and no background beyond high school in the basic sciences. Nevertheless, many people who have backgrounds in nutrition are saying that it is an amazing refresher course full of nuggets of valuable information in each lesson. Sign up completely free by Facebook Messenger or by email at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash 101. This episode is brought to you by Testing Nutritional Status, the ultimate cheat sheet. This is my recipe to empower you to banish any deficiency or nutritional imbalance from your body. I've been through the pain of my teeth falling apart, my stomach being in constant pain, and my OCD going off the rails during my stint with veganism to the point where panic attacks were the norm and I was afraid to eat any of the food in my house. I've been through the path of healing using nutrient-dense animal foods to nourish all the systems of my body and become a new person. But I've also learned that my needs change over time. The red meat and liver that were so healing in my recovery from veganism later started sapping my energy and brain power only to find out that I'm genetically predisposed to iron overload and need to manage it with blood donations. And I've learned from friends, colleagues, and clients that everyone is different. Your needs are not mine. Mine aren't what they were 10 years ago. Yours won't be what they are now in 10 years. That's why we need a precise recipe to know exactly what's missing, exactly what's overloaded, exactly what's imbalanced, and an action plan to fix things, and a way to measure our success. That's what I've done with testing nutritional status, the ultimate cheat sheet. Get your copy at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash cheat sheet and use the code LIGHT20, that's L-I-T-E and the number 20, 
LIGHT20 to get 20% off. For ad-free versions of these episodes with transcripts that you can read and getting early access to the episodes often weeks or maybe even months ahead of time, you can sign up for the CMJ Masterpass at chrismasterjohnphd.com slash masterpass and use the code LIGHT10 to get 10% lifetime discount. The audio of this episode was enhanced and post-processed by Bob Devodian of Torian Mixing. You can find more of his work at torianonlinemixing.com. All right, I hope you found this useful. Signing off, this is Chris Masterjohn of chrismasterjohnphd.com. This has been Chris Masterjohn Light, and I will see you in the next episode.